Welcome. This is Money Heart, where we explore the emotional side of money. I'm Camille Diaz, and today we're discussing empathy and imagination. My guest is Dr. Alexandra Luce. She's passionate about helping people improve their creative and critical thinking skills so they can see more possibilities and make better decisions. She completed her PhD at the University of Cambridge, and for over a decade, she's designed and taught graduate courses in intelligence anal analysis. She founded her company, Acuity Development, to show more people how they can take their thinking to the next level so they can get next level results. She lives in Montreal, Canada, and she loves to travel. Alex, welcome to Money Heart. Thanks, Camila. It's great to be here. So what is intelligence analysis? Because that sounds really fancy. <laughs> so that's a great question. And I know when a lot of people first think of it, they might think it has to do about like being smart or something psychological. Mm -hmm. um, but really the field is about using information to make better decisions about the future. So most traditionally, it would be, let's say, a government or an agency like CIA, who is going to be collecting information and using it to give policymakers and decision makers an advantage. Basically, what do we know now? And it can be from open sources, secret sources, what have you. What information can help us make better decisions about the future? So traditionally, it really arose from the military and government, but it can be used in basically any domain. Um, like if you think of your favorite charity or schools or businesses, there are all sorts of applications. It's basically collecting information, analyzing it and using it to make better decisions about the future. I love that. That's really cool. So as, as close as possible to predicting the future. Yeah. <laughs> yes no. So, so forecasting, forecasting is the word that, that we use more often. Yes. You think like a weather forecast, you know, you know, whatever they say, it's not always going to happen. Right. Because right. the future is so hard to like, you, you can't predict the future. So <laughs> forecasting is, is sort of a nicer way of saying it. And I think a little more accurate than saying, Hey, we know with certainty that this is going to happen. Right. Yeah, that's very true. Very true. I think that's always the the way, even if people, you know, even if you see in a movie predicting the future, they're like, well, it's still not set. We're not quite sure. Yeah. And there, like there is an awesome quote from a strategist, um, Colin Gray, um, who says that the future is plural, right? Like there is just, there are so many possibilities. We can't know them all. And that's why it's very helpful to think in scenarios and possibilities instead of this is the one thing that is going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So coming up with multiple options of what might happen and yeah. then you're kind of ready. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, or at least more cool. ready than if you hadn't come up with it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's a good point. You're more ready, more ready than if you hadn't considered what might happen. I like that. I like that. Um, okay. So you're focusing on how people are thinking and kind of analyzing all this data. Um, and I want to come back to that in a second, because when we first started planning this, you talked about how you'd made some poor financial decisions in the past. And since we talk about money on the show, um, I, I feel like it would be really great to kind of hear your one of your stories of how maybe your th thinking wasn't the best. Um, and then you can prove to us how much you've changed it. <laughs> <laughs> because okay. I know that this is like a yeah. one-off kind of a thing. Um, but will you share the boyfriend and the taxes story with us? Yeah, absolutely. So this was quite a few years ago um, and I was working on contracts at the time. And because I was working for a few different um, organizations uh, and it was contract work, uh, my taxes were not being deducted and that was up to me. And I was not wise <laughs> and I had not been like setting aside money from each paycheck to go towards taxes, yep. which was a very bad decision. And then, Just so you know, I've done this too. When, okay. when we first became self-employed, we had the same problem. I had yeah. no idea that you had to set aside money for taxes yourself because I don't know why I didn't think of it. It, it just yeah. didn't even, it wasn't on my radar. Like I didn't even think about it. And I know. We got, and <laughs> and like, even, even though it's painful when you do it, it is so much more painful if you don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> that is accurate. Yes. It yes. Just and we, thousands of dollars that we found out our tax ladies like you owe $19,000. And we're like, well, what, what? 
what? Yep. I was not prepared. <laughs> yeah. So this happened to you. So you had the same thing, working on contract, no saving yeah. for taxes. Yeah. Then what? And then I get to the end of the year, like the end of, I guess, when I was doing my taxes. So mm -hmm. approaching, approaching ta the tax deadline. And I realized, surprise, um, you owe this money in taxes. And I hadn't set it aside. So I thought, oh man, like, I don't, I don't have enough money to pay this because I'd had a good year and whatever. And, and my boyfriend at the time who I was living with, um, he also did his taxes and he owed some money. Um, and I was like, oh, well, I can't pay my taxes, but let me pay yours, which like, I don't know if I just wanted to feel like I could accomplish something and like complete something instead of like paying a fraction, I'll pay the whole thing. It was just such a stupid decision um, because I wasn't taking care of myself. It's not like he helped me out in return or anything. It was just, it was a really boneheaded decision. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's sometimes, you know, you just as you were saying that I was thinking about sometimes it's easier or it feels easier to help somebody deal with their problem yes. than to deal with our own. Oh like, my goodness. Oh, your room is a mess or your house <laughs> is a mess. I will help you clean it. And then you go home and you're like, man, my kitchen floor really needs to be mopped, but I don't want to do it. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally agree with you on that. Yeah. The gardener whose grass is growing, you know, like 12 inches high or something. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah, you just, you were just, you know, being kind and helpful, but I, I totally get it. Like, that's not the greatest financial decision is I can't pay my own stuff, but I'll pay somebody else's. We're good. <laughs> so what is going on in our brain that it is so hard for us to see or imagine what might happen in the future and really like own it? Because clearly you mm. some, on some level knew if I don't pay my own taxes, it's going to be a problem. Yeah. And it probably would have been better for you to call up the tax guys and be like, Hey, I can't pay all of this. Can I do payments? Can I send you what I have? Absolutely. Whatever. But somehow your brain was like, Meh, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> what's, what's going on there? What, where's our, where is this seems like we all do it. So we must have it built in what's happening. Right. So I think we have, we have a tendency towards very short-term thinking. And in mm -hmm. general, we're not great at looking out over the long-term. And we also have a really powerful capacity to ignore things, <laughs> which in some, it, like that's good in terms of if you wanna focus on something that can be very useful at times, right. but we can also completely ignore things that we should be doing that are actually really good for us. Mm -hmm. And so, I think when I made that decision, it was like, okay, I want to pay taxes, <laughs> right? Like right. I want to support the government and pay for services and everything. Um, but I also, I was just, I don't know if part of it was back then I was really a perfectionist. And to me, like only paying like a small fraction of a large bill didn't feel nearly as satisfying as being able to say here we we're going to take care of this it's all good right so i don't know i i also like i i enjoy helping people so i think emotionally um there was obviously a reward in there for me mm -hmm. and i just was not thinking to my future self i wasn't thinking about the consequences. It was just a really like quick emotional decision that was not or did not involve actually thinking the situation through, which really like it would not have taken a whole lot of thinking, but I just, I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even start down that path. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that you brought up that it was an emotional decision because we hear this pretty often in, let's say in sales, anything that somebody is buying or selling, the buyer's making an emotional decision of whether they want it or not. And they're either using logic on the front end and then going and emotionally picking it up <laughs> or using logic on the back end to convince themselves yeah. it was a good idea. Yeah. But the actual decision is emotional. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that has such power and it can be, it can be power for good or power for not good. Right. Like yeah. sometimes we, if, if we're thinking out about the future and we're making if we have this emotional connection with our future self 
and we think like, hey, I want to set this person up for success. I want to make their life easier then than it is now. Mm -hmm. That can be really, really useful. But we can also be extremely reactive and making decisions because it's easier not to act now. Um, because we don't have to feel certain things because we don't have to take action. And that's just emotionally easier to deal with, especially like, I think, I think it takes a lot of work to think into the future and to be able to get out of that. Oh, let me, let me just do this because it'll make me feel good now or I'll get rewards for it now. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that's much more immediate and easier to grasp than thinking about yourself five or 10 or like 30 years from now. Right. Yeah. So this kind of plays into not just money decisions, like, am I going to save for my emergency fund or am I going to buy these shoes mm -hmm. or will I, you know, am I going to be disciplined and put money away for retirement or mm -hmm. am I just going to drive a bigger car, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, but it's, it kind of plays across lots of things. Cause I think you mentioned when we talked about like our health, you know, yes. am, am I going to plan my meals for this week? And on Sunday mm -hmm. afternoon, I'm going to, I'm going to make my little boxes for taking to work during the week or, or not. Yeah. I'm just going to buy pizza or whatever, you know, eat all the donuts in the break room. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's huge of, of, so, so you brought up something really cool of thinking about your future self mm -hmm. and being nice to them. Yeah, being kind to them. So I guess this really started, I listened to an interview with Elizabeth Gilbert a few years ago, who it just seems like such a wise, kind person. And one of the things she mentioned was being a good friend to yourself, right? Like how you talk to yourself, how you act towards yourself, because it's so easy for us to do the same to other people, right? Like you're, you're not going to yell at your best friend. You're not going to insult them, but we so often do that to ourselves. And she was talking about being a good friend to yourself. Mm -hmm. And she said that one thing she often does, um, she'll also like think about her future self and actually have a dialogue with that person. So if she is making a decision like, for example, like, do I want to get maintenance done on my car? The mechanic has said that, you know, something needs to be fixed. Am I going to do it now or am I going to put it off? Right. And so she'll think, you know what, I'm going to do this now because it's going to help out future Liz. So I'm doing this for her. And then, you know, after the car is working great again, <laughs> a few months later, her future self will be like, thank you, old Liz, like you, you've made my life so much easier. So she's literally having a dialogue with her future self. And I've started to do sort of the, the same, the same kind of thing. And when I'm, especially when I'm tired. <laughs> so if I'm looking ahead, um, even if I'm a little bit tired, I'll think like, you know, what is going to set me up really well for tomorrow or for next week or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Um, and I will literally think about, okay, yeah, it's going to take a little bit of effort now, but it's going to make things so much easier <laughs> in a few days. And the more I do that, it's just, it, it becomes sort of the default mode, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not just operating in the present, you're, very regularly thinking about your future self and what you can do for that. I say that person, but like it, it's you, right? So yeah. it can be super simple things like deciding like, Hey, here are the meals I'm cooking for the week. So now my grocery list is really easy to do. And I know that I'll have food and whatever, mm -hmm. or it can be major financial decisions about investments or whatever else. So it works on, all sorts of levels. And I found it really helpful. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I was, you were talking about the mechanic, you know, and having the car repairs done, I can just imagine future me <laughs> broken down on the side of the road yes. in the rain, <laughs> like just all of the curse words coming out because I was so angry <laughs> that past me was not kind enough to get that darn thing fixed. Yeah. which would have taken, you know, take, it might take two hours out of the day, you know, get it there, drop it off, wait for it, whatever. But now future me is standing there cold and wet and miserable <laughs> and, and late to whatever I was going to right. and, and having to deal with this 
problem that could have been easily solved had past me done it. So, yeah. and, and I feel like it's like that for a lot of things. And get this, I feel like this just really connects to your story from the beginning of how emotionally you were willing to help someone else. <laughs> yeah. But you won't do it for yourself. Yeah. So if you make future you in your brain like someone else, mm-hmm. you'll be nice to someone else. You'll be nice to future you because it's not you. Yeah. So that's really interesting because yeah, you can see it as a different person who you can be kind to, but if you, if you can go that step further and like see it as you and love you, I think that's even more powerful. So, um, Hal Hirschfield from UCLA, he's a psychologist and he's done various studies about emotions and time Mm -hmm. and how emotions affect our decisions about the future. So he's Mm -hmm. looked at things like saving for retirement. He's also looked at like youth and um, how you're thinking about yourself in the future can change your decisions about whether you're going to do illegal activities or not. (laughs) And what's really interesting is he's found that most people, when they think of their future self, it's like a stranger, like another person that they don't know. It's like the very abstract sort of out there. There's no real connection between them and me. It's just this idea, right? So one of his most interesting studies involved virtual reality. And Mm -hmm. basically they, half the participants um, came in and they put on this headset and they saw themselves as they were like they walked around and they saw themselves in a mirror. Right. And then the, the, the researchers were just interviewing them about their life. The other half got, when they got to the mirror, they saw this future aged version of themselves in the mirror and whatever they were doing, it was mirroring that. So they could like see themselves moving and everything And the researchers were interviewing them about their life, asking them questions like, so where are you from? Um, You know, what do you really love to do? What are your passions in life? So they're answering these questions and they're seeing this older version of themselves at the same time, right? Like as the words are coming, they can see Uh their mouth moving and everything. So there's this really strong emotional connection that's created. And so after this, each of the groups has to do a task and it's basically about allocating money to various things like spending it on fun things now and saving for the future. And they found that the, the, the group that had seen their future selves in a very concrete form, right? You formed this bond um, that they saved more than twice as much <laughs> as the other group. And even seeing like photographs of your future self, if you use an app or something like that, mm-hmm. that also helps to like form an emotional bond. So it's not just like some random person that you're thinking about in the future or all abstract and up in your mind. Like there's a connection through your heart. So Yeah. And that gets to that concept of if there is a future self you want to be. Yes. <laughs> if you imagine yourself as that future self, mm-hmm. then you will automatically take the actions required to become that future self. Exactly. Exactly. Be, yeah. But if you can't see yourself yeah. in that role or in that way, or like, mm-hmm. let's say you want to make more money. Okay. Well, if you can't see yourself as someone who makes $250,000 a year, you yeah. won't take any actions necessary to do it. Right. But if, yeah. but if you can picture yourself as that person, oh, what would they do? Yeah. Oh, well, if they're going to do this, oh, they're going to, you know, do more advertising or they're going to make more calls or they're going to network better. Whatever the things are, they're going to manage their calendar. They're going to spend time, you know, you'll start doing the actions because you see yourself as that future. Yeah. And when you slip a little bit and you don't do the actions for whatever reason, you're tired or, mm-hmm. you know, whatever, whatever it might be, there's something in your brain that clicks and is like, Hey, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, yeah. this, this isn't going to add up to the result that you said you wanted. So do you want that result or are we going to throw that out and you just do whatever? Right. <laughs> right? What do right. You, yes. What do you really want? How serious are you? Yeah. How serious are you? And how well can you really picture that thing, whatever, yeah. whatever, how, how concrete have you made that in your mind? 
Yeah. And part of making that concrete is like, yes, you need to use your imagination. Absolutely. But I think research can also be extremely, extremely useful, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it is, you know, studying other people or finding models and seeing the types of behaviors and actions that they do. The imagination is great. And then when you back it up with actual details and research, it's, it's even more powerful. Right. So that concept of like becoming the five people you hang out with the most. Yes. <laughs> and if you don't hang out physically with five people that you really want to become, then mm -hmm. you've got to hang out uh, non-physically reading their yeah. books or watching yeah. their videos or taking their class or whatever to, in exactly. some way influence yourself with those people so that you start to get that idea to gel in your head of this is me. Yeah. And like you, that's so important because what you like, what are you absorbing? And I think when you, when you come up with this concrete idea of what it is you want, when you've got a picture in your mind, um, it is, it's way easier to find those other people and to put yourself around people and material that is going to feed that. Whereas if you never define it, it's just sort of random, right? Like you're, <laughs> you're not being intentional about it because you don't have an intent. But when you take the time and think, what do I want my future self to be like? What do, what do I want to be doing? What do I want to have? Who do I want to become? Mm -hmm. That gives you so much fuel. <laughs> it does. It really does. And my uh, one of my coaches would say, instead of saying, what do I want to have? Say, what would you love to have? Yes. yes. Well, because that is the stronger word. Yes. And actually, he was one on one of the early episodes. This is salt. And so he's always okay. reminding me, yeah. um, what would you love your life to look like? What would you love for it to be? What would you love to have? What would you love to do? Because that's way at the top of that hierarchy. Want is, is way down here. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think so often we're conditioned to just like sort of want what's around us or to have to have pretty low standards. And when you ask different questions, it so totally opens things up. One of my favorite questions is how can I, like, what can I do to make this amazing? Right? Like whether what I'm- What a great question. Or, I love that question. Or whether I'm thinking about like planning a weekend away with friends, like what can I do to make this amazing? I actually, I had a meet and greet with one of my classes last week and I said like, hey, what can you do to make this term amazing? amazing in the sense of it's a great learning experience and you are enjoying it <laughs> while you're doing it. I don't know if they'd ever heard that question in a course before, but I think it got them thinking in a different way about, okay, I need to do more than just like do the readings and like check things off on my schedule. Like what, what else can I do? And a lot of that I think was about building stronger relationships with other classmates and things like that. So yeah. That's it. And that's, I love the way you put that and putting it in a question uh, because that is a, that is a brain hack. Yes. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the book called Affirmation spelled with an O instead of oh. an I. It's by Noah St. John. Mm -hmm. And in there, the, I'll sum up the book, but still read it because it's yep. cool. Um, but it's a short read. It's not a long book. The idea yep. is, you know, oftentimes we stand in the mirror and we say, I am this, I am this, you know, like I am a millionaire. I am a millionaire. <laughs> well, the, the voice in the back of your brain is like, no, you're not. <laughs> I've seen your bank account. No, you're not. Like, it's just disagreeing with you the entire time. Mm -hmm. You ask yourself, what am I doing today to become a millionaire? Mm. How am I changing my life to yeah. increase my income? What am I doing? Yeah. Then you're asking the question and your brain goes, oh, problem to solve. I'm on it. Exactly. And it is so specific and it is about right now today. It's not like in the next six months, what can you do? What can you do today? Yes. Right. Yes. Easy problem to solve. <laughs> Easy problem to solve. What am I doing today? What am I doing right now Yeah. to change whatever it is you're trying to accomplish or be? Yeah. Yeah. That is so fabulous. This has been so fun. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Alex can be reached through her website, acuitydev.ca or on LinkedIn. 
Thank you to all of our listeners and viewers. I'm your host, Camille Diaz. The show is sponsored by Serenity Financial, a Five Rings financial agency specializing in financial education, living benefits, and guaranteed lifetime income. Be sure to follow Money Heart on social media at Money Heart Show and on our website, moneyheartshow.com. Today's money mantra that Alex provided is be kind to your future self. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's with pleasure. Thank you.